Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 14th of January. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. We open with tragedy in the south. First Sergeant Avi Gronov, a 20-year-old border policeman from Sterot, was killed from the accidental firing of a weapon in a base in Kibbutz Yad Mordechai, close to the Gaza border. The authorities are investigating the incident. No school trips, no school. That was the battle cry of the National Student and Youth Council, which announced a three-day nationwide strike of half a million secondary school students. They did not go to classrooms to protest the cancellation of their annual school trips by the teachers' union. For their part, the teachers say that they will not take part in the trips until they are granted immunity from criminal charges in the event of a student being injured during the outings. The striking students held demonstrations outside their schools, and the student councils organized alternative trips in parks across the country in collaboration with the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel, which agreed to chaperone the teens. The local authorities have submitted a petition to the National Labor Court requesting a restraining order against the teachers. Ministry of Education officials insist that the Attorney General has ruled out the possibility of granting the teachers sweeping immunity and that the matter of legal responsibility should be resolved by the court. Turning to the Knesset election and some surprises on the labor list, after results from yesterday's primary were announced this morning, and Abayat UD party members are voting today for their list. Here with more is Ellie Wagelanter. Two weeks from tomorrow is the deadline for all parties to submit their concluding list for the election, and we now have more final results. Former party chief Shelly Yechamovich emerged as the big winner of the Labor primary vote, snagging the third slot on the Knesset list after party leader, leader Heizik Herzog and Hatsunawa partner Tsipi Livni. Yechamovich led a wave of strong results for female candidates, with women occupying three of the top four spots, four of the top ten, and seven in the top 25. Despite her loss to Herzog in the 2013 primaries, Yechimovich had expressed complete support for the party's leader in recent months and had backed Herzog's decision to merge with Hatznua. Rising star Stav Shafir took the fourth slot, while Itzik Shmuley, who, took, who together with Shafir were leading figures in 2011 social justice protests, received the fifth spot. One party member said she voted for Shafir because she was very happy with her work in the 19th Knesset. Let's say that in the last primaries, I was, I, I was skeptical about her because I didn't know whether she will actually manage to be a great politician. But during those two years, I, I saw that she, she is a really great one. Like, she really fights for what she believes. For, for what she believes. And uh, let's say she had my voice to begin with. Here you see the list of the top ten positions. Herzog, Livni, Yachimovich, Shafir, and Shmuley, followed by Omar Barlev, Hilik Bar in a reserved slot for Party Secretary General, and Amir Peretz in a reserved Hatnua slot, Mirab Michaeli, and Eitan Kabul in a disappointing 10th slot. Herzog wrote on his Facebook page this morning, We selected a good list yesterday, honest, brave, and combative, with a lot of Zionism that combines experience with groundbreaking thinking, deep-rooted ideologies, and a great ability to execute. And today is Bayat UD's turn with party leader Naftali Bennett declaring that the party had successfully moved from a fringe group to a core movement in Israel. Some 77,000 party members are eligible to vote on the party list, which has 37 candidates competing for nine realistic places in the 20th Knesset. That includes 11 women. Between spots on the list, say for Tkuma faction within the party, which held its primary earlier this week, and three more reserved for candidates of Bennett's choosing. At one of the Jerusalem polling stations this morning, I spoke with Knesset member Ayala Chaked, who told me that she was very proud of the potential list her party was forming. I think it's a very, very good list, uh, both the existing Knesset members and the new candidates. And I'm sure that if everyone, everyone from the 77,000 people who are part of this party will choose the best list, we will get a very, very good team. You have different kinds of people represented in the list. Jerusalem across the board. Some people say, religious, non-religious, people say it's a party that doesn't have a central identity. The central identity is the uh, Zionist Orthodox identity. Uh, we have uh, different people who believe in those values, but definitely the identity is the Zionist religious identity. You're not religious. Yes, but I believe in the same values. The 262 voting stations at 126 locations across the country will close at 10 o'clock tonight. And the results of the vote are to be released tomorrow morning. Laura? Thank you, Ellie. 
In more election news, following a close race that included mutual mudslinging, allegations, threats, and forgeries, Yossi Bacha was elected mayor of Bat Yam. Bacha will replace his strongest supporter, former mayor Shlomi Lachiani, who was forced out of office following his conviction for breach of trust and barred from politics for a seven-year period for moral turpitude. Bachar took 50.6% of the vote, beating his opponent Eli Arif by some 500 votes. Voter turnout was relatively low, with only 31% of the registered voters casting their ballots. France is still reeling from the wave of terror attacks that rocked Paris. Officials, meanwhile, warn of the dangers posed from European nationals who fought in Syria and Iraq with jihadist groups and then returned home. Abiyaz Magodudkevic reports. Days after a wave of terror attacks claimed 17 lives in Paris, heavily armed policemen and soldiers patrolled the streets, guarding Jewish schools and institutions, government buildings and popular tourist sites. Before dawn this morning, people began queuing up to obtain a copy of the new Charlie Hebdo edition. 500,000 copies were published in France today, and another batch will be published and distributed Friday, bringing the total number to 3 million copies. The latest edition that features the Prophet Muhammad with a tear running down his face, saying all is forgiven, also proved popular on the internet, with copies being sold on eBay for record prices. Defending the cover on the latest edition, Charlie Abdo cartoonist Renal Luzier said as children everyone liked to draw, even the terrorists were once children, but they lost their sense of humor in the childish soul at some point. Meanwhile, Robert Wainwright, director of Europol, warned the entire continent is facing a severe security threat. He estimated that more than 5,000 Europeans have traveled to Iraq and Syria to join jihadist groups. When they return to their homeland, the radicalized fighters could return with the intent to wage attacks similar to those in Paris, he warned. New video footage released yesterday shows Sharif and Said Kwashi as they left the Charlie Hebdo office last week after gunning down 12 people in cold blood. The two brothers took their time changing the magazines in their automatic weapons before getting into the getaway car. As they fled the area, a police car with its lights flashing approaches the vehicle. Calmly and coolly, the brothers get out of the car and begin shooting at the police as the car reversed back down the road, without a single shot being fired at the brothers, who sped away. French lawmakers yesterday stood in silence for one minute in a parliamentary session dedicated to the terror attacks. French Prime Minister Manuel Valls warned his countrymen that high risks remain. He emphasized the need to fight anti-Semitism and the hatred towards the state of Israel. He also stressed the need to protect France's Muslim citizens from hate crimes, noting Islam is the second largest religion in France. At the end of his speech, lawmakers broke into a spontaneous rendition of the French national anthem. Margot Dudkevich, IBA News. Even before the deadly terror attacks in Paris last week, there was a dramatic increase in anti-Semitic incidents in France. In response, the Beitar Youth Movement began training Jews in self-defense, as we see in this report from Vokativ. Thank you. 
En France, en 2014, de nos jours, il y a encore du sang juif qui coule. Les nazis d'avant par l'allemand et les nazis d'aujourd'hui par l'arabe. Housing Minister Uri Ariel has instructed authorities to examine how to expand existing settlements to make room for an expected massive influx of immigration from France. In a letter sent to the Yesha Settlers Council, Ariel told them to prepare to absorb a wave of French immigration and to find suitable sites for expansion in Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. Ariel has been an outspoken supporter of settlement expansion, even as it has come under increasingly severe criticism from the international community. Ariel did not provide any evidence of interest on the part of French Jews to settle in the West Bank. 45% of British Jews fear that they have no long-term future in the UK. This according to a survey published today by the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, which polled more than 2,200 British Jews. The survey showed that 58% were concerned that they had no future anywhere in Europe. Some 25% of those surveyed said they have considered leaving Britain in the past two years. 2014 had more anti-Semitic incidents recorded by police than at any time in the last three decades. President Reuven Rivlin has urged the heads of AIPAC to use their powerful U.S. lobby to help the Obama administration better understand Israel amid efforts to renew peace talks with the Palestinians. Meeting with the board of directors of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee in the official presidential residence, Rivlin referred to PA President Mahmoud Abbas as my good friend, but said he wasn't sure if the Palestinians were willing to accept the two-state solution. My friend, President Abu Mazen. Although he considered me as a friend, he would not say, my friend, Ruvi Rivlin. He is rejecting the idea of negotiation because he cannot accept the ideas of uh, two states for two people without bringing the Palestinian side to be exactly like Israel. If we have Air Force, they would like to have an Air Force. If we have Ben Gurion Airport, they would like to have Ben Gurion Airport. If we have borders with uh, Jordan, in the north, they would like to have borders in Jordan, with Jordan. So I really believe that we have to use your efforts and your abilities to have once again a dialogue with the administration to let them understand that we have to agree about the really necessary standings when we are going once again to try and to find the final status between the Israeli and the Palestinians. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is in Geneva for talks with his Iranian counterpart on how to speed up nuclear talks. Kerry will meet with Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif ahead of a new round of formal talks with the P5 plus one beginning tomorrow. Negotiators have given themselves a March target date to turn an interim accord into a framework agreement that would address the world's concerns about Tehran's nuclear program. They have set the end of June as a target date for a final pact. 
German political and religious leaders appealed for tolerance last night in the wake of the Paris terror attacks, a message meant to counter both religious extremists and growing anti-Islam protests in Germany. Chancellor Angela Merkel and President Joachim Gauck were among those who took part in the rally organized by Muslim groups near Berlin's iconic Brandenburg Gate and the French Embassy, where wreaths were laid in memory of the 17 people killed by Islamic terrorists in Paris last week. A group calling itself Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamization of the West, or Pegida, has been staging anti-Islam protests in Dresden for the last three months. The latest protest on Monday drew a record 25,000 supporters, with speakers citing the Paris attacks as proof of the danger posed by Islam. Merkel said that excluding population groups due to their faith or their origin is beneath the dignity of our liberal state. Hatred of foreigners, racism and extremism have no place in this country. Gauck told a crowd of several thousand that there were reasons to be concerned about young German Muslims going to fight in Syria and Iraq, but insisted Germany wouldn't allow itself to be split by extremists from any side. An appeals court has overturned the last remaining conviction against Egypt's deposed leader Hosni Mubarak and ordered his retrial on corruption charge, opening the door for his possible release. The ruling, just days before the fourth anniversary of the start of the 2011 anti-Mubarak uprising, pointed to how far Egypt has moved away from its revolutionary fervor to bring down the regime. Another court cleared Mubarak who will turn 87 in May in the most important case against him. In the end of November, the court dropped charges that Mubarak was responsible for the killing of protesters during the 2011 uprising. Turning to New York, where the PLO and the Palestinian Authority have gone on trial for the sanctioning of terror attacks in Jerusalem between 2001 and 2004. The billion-dollar lawsuit was filed in a Manhattan federal court by victims of the attacks, who must prove that the Palestinian groups were culpable. Jury selection is still underway, and the trial itself is expected to last about three months. The lawsuit was brought in 2004 under the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1991 by victims of seven shootings and bombings in and around Jerusalem that killed 33 people and wounded hundreds more. The victims included scores of U.S. citizens. If successful, the plaintiffs are expected to be awarded a considerable amount of money, Lawyers for the PA and the PLO filed papers claiming that the U.S. court had no jurisdiction and warned that there could be consequences with bringing a foreign government to trial for supporting terrorism and might worsen tensions in the region. The Indonesian Navy has released video footage of divers retrieving the cockpit voice recorder of the crashed Air Asia flight QZ8501. Divers swam past the debris and recovered the recorder on a sandy seabed off the coast of Kalimantan. Investigators in Jakarta are still trying to determine the sequence of events that led to the air bus to plunge into the sea. 162 people perished in the crash on December 28th, and search teams are still scouring for debris and bodies. Until now, 48 bodies have been retrieved. The startup nation has done it again. It's called Hware by the Kfar Saba-based Health Watch Technologies. They produce a digital shirt that monitors heart activity and sends the data directly to your doctor. Reporter Alexandra Jen has that story. It's the newest innovation in health technology created right here in Israel. What you're looking at is a Hware digital garment. It's a stretchy shirt interwoven with electrocardiogram or ECG sensors. These sensors monitor the person's heart activity and immediately send data to your cardiologist via smartphone. HY digital garments are made for both men and women. The product comes at a pivotal time as heart disease is currently one of the top causes of death in Israel. It's washable and it has recently been approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration. Health Watch's Dove Rubin talks about the benefits of this high-tech product able to detect any sort of disease states that the heart and the person may find themselves in and transmit that data immediately via Bluetooth, via the smartphone, and directly to their cardiologist, saving very valuable time to get treatment. One of the standout qualities of this shirt is the 12 lead sensors that provide full coverage of the heart. If there are irregularities coming from different areas of the heart, HRA will detect it. Other devices monitor only one part of the heart. What is also revolutionary about this product is how little it interferes with your daily life. Do all the medical work on the person 
And the person is continuing his way of life. He doesn't change the way of life. Uh, and this is a revolution. So basically, if you are monitored uh, all the time and you go to work and you go to, to do the sport, you are with your family and so on, uh, and no obstacle, no obstruction and so on, this is the revolution. Welcome to the Kafar Saba factory, where H garments are manufactured. You see the giant machines spinning what appears to be thread, but it's actually textile electrodes interwoven into the fabric. Once the material is processed, voila, out comes a shirt, complete with 12 sensors and a small pocket to hold a transmitter that generates real-time data. The Israeli entrepreneurs plan to expand their reach with a product specifically for women. For example, they have a prototype for a shirt that pregnant women can wear to monitor the fetus, the mother, and the uterine contraction. That's one more product to add to Startup Nation. Alexander Jen for IBA News. Turning to local finance, and the shekel was mixed in foreign currency trading. While share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange were down, here's a look at the late afternoon numbers. Turning to the weather, and rain is expected in the north and center of the country with snow predicted on Mount Hermon. Temperatures will drop slightly. Here the highs and lows for the next 24 hours at home and abroad. And that's all for this newscast. Aaron Viner will be here tomorrow at the same time. Until then, have a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.